All right. So thank you everyone again uh, for joining us uh, today. Depending on where you are, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Um, my name is Avi Stamen, and I am the CEO of Academic Language Experts. Um, thank you for joining us. This is the fifth installment of our publication success interview series. And if you've joined us before, you'll know that every month uh, I speak with innovative thought leaders in the field of academia or in the world of academia about how they're influencing academic publishing in the hopes of trying to create a bridge between academic authors and academic publishers and improve the dialogue and communication between them. Uh, today, I'm delighted to be joined by Stephanie Paulvast, who is the head of open research at Brill. Um, there may be no other topic that's so critical to the future of academic publishing and about which we know so very little, uh, such as open access. Open access is slowly but surely reshaping the scientific world and making research available to the masses. However, at the same time, uh, it's putting a tremendous burden on researchers who don't necessarily have the money or resources uh, to support the open access publication. So in our discussion today, we're going to discuss how scholars can go about making their research open while trying to make it uh, affordable, but also avoiding dangerous uh, pitfalls along the way. Uh, I urge you not to be shy, ask questions on the Zoom chat as they come up. Uh, we might not be able to get to them right away, but there is a time at the end of the session that we're going to be uh, re addressing specific questions from the audience. Um, and if you don't, if you have a more personal question, or if your question is not answered during the session, you're welcome to follow up. Uh, Stephanie and I will both be sharing our contact information, and you can follow up with us after the session uh, and uh, ask us any questions. You can also send us a chat or a, a private chat. Um, the interview is being recorded. And anyone who's uh, registered, whether you've joined us today, thank you, or whether uh, you're joining us just for, uh, for the recording, uh, you'll be able to receive the recording in the next 72 hours. Um, and we'll send that out via email. Before we kick off the event, I wanna share some of our exciting achievements. Um, we're grateful and proud at Academic Language Experts to have helped scholars translate, edit, and prepare their research in over 50 languages. Articles and books we worked on in 2020 were published with top academic publishers around the world, including Yale University Press, Harvard University Press, Cambridge University Press, and of course, Brill. At Academic Language Experts, we provide customized translation, editing, and academic support services to researchers, scientists, and other professionals to help them produce publication-ready texts at the highest level. We also help scholars looking for help polishing their book proposals prior to submission to their dream publisher. So if that's something you're looking to do, please do be in touch. It's our mission to help authors achieve publication success and be a source of guidance and support along the way. And now, without further ado, I wanna introduce you to Stephanie. Stephanie Paulvast for the last five years has been at the forefront of open, access publish of open access publishing. After a stint at Utrecht University as an open access publisher, Stephanie rejoined the team at Brill as head of research, where she is responsible for overseeing all open access books and journal pu and journal publishing. Yeah, Stephanie's leadership. Brill is one of the largest <coughs> open access oh, book publishers in the um, United States. Not a good time right now. Stephanie, can you unmute yourself? Yes, here I am. There we go. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Avi. Thank you so much. And uh, it's really a pleasure to, uh, to be here today. And uh, yeah, to like I said, uh, to talk about open access, it's really a bit of an indulgence for me to uh, be able to talk about, uh, to talk about my topic um, this uh, next uh, 30 minutes or so. And yeah, thank you to everyone who's, who's joining us and listening in. Right. All right, so I wanna start off with a quick exercise um, to, get, to get everyone involved, but also, to, uh, but also just to, to get a feel for the crowd and for the audience. And I wanna ask everyone uh, to quickly take no more than 15 seconds and um, uh, do a free association, a free association exercise. Um, when, when, we, when we hear the words open access, uh, what exactly do you think of? Uh, it doesn't need to be long sentences, just one or two words, jot them down in the chat uh, and share uh, with everyone. What does open access mean uh, to you when you hear those words? Uh, 
Yeah, see, this is why I, I'm very happy that we did this because the range, I don't know, you know if, if everyone's reading all the other answers, but the range of answers here is pretty incredible. Um, something from, you know, incredibly expensive to, um, you know, to the future of academic publishing to uh, public engagement, democratization of knowledge. I think that's definitely true. Uh, expensive for authors, right? It's, it's, it's quite incredible how one uh, topic can have so many positive and negative attributes at the same time. Uh, but I think that's kind of why Stephanie and I decided to do a session on this topic is because there's, there's sort of this, um, you know, uh, dichotomy uh, of that, that, that's involved. Um, Stephanie, any thoughts about, you know, some of the comments that are rolling in? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're familiar, of course, and um, I'm sure it will touch on, and well, I mean, looking at them, I think it will touch on everyone, anyone, everything uh, in the course of this interview. So that's, that's reassuring, nothing wildly um, uh, unfamiliar, but, um, but yeah, it is very interesting. It's such a kaleidoscopic topic, uh, and indeed there are so many aspects, and, you know, that's, that's also why I'm really happy that we can do sessions like these, so that we can really uh, hopefully uh, provide a little bit of, of clarification. Okay, so I think we've done enough of, uh, you know, surrounding the topic. Let's jump straight in. Can you try and define for us, and I know that's easier said than done, but can you try and define for us what does open access mean? Um, what's it all about? And also maybe a little bit of the background of how it came to be. What's the history of open access? Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, you know, I think it was already mentioned a couple of times in, in the chat. Um, basically, in its essence, of course, open access means that a publication is available to anyone, uh, anywhere, uh, for free. So, um, uh, so there, there's the accessibility component. Um, the other important component that sometimes people maybe uh, forget about is um, sort of the, the reuse component. So uh, copyright for open access is usually with the author, but the idea of open access is not just that it gives access to research, but also that it really uh, enables other people to use that research, you know, to, to really accelerate um, uh, research and new developments. Um, and so that reuse component, um, that, that's uh, helped by uh, a, a specific type of license um, that determines, you know, the extent that uh, that publication can, can be reused. So that's really the basics. Of course, uh, another component that was also mentioned in the chat is that uh, indeed the publisher can't sell the publication, so they need to recoup their costs um, uh, in another way. Um, and I'm sure that we'll touch on that at length also uh, in the course of, of this, uh, this interview. Um, maybe a little bit about the background. I mean, you know, I think open access has gained a lot of traction the last sort of decade or so, but it's actually a little bit older than that. It's, it's really going back to the early 1990s. Um, and it really directly as a result of the, yeah, the advent, the rise of, uh, of the internet, um, and, uh, you know, when, when that's developed, um, already some fields uh, in the early 1990s already started to uh, publicly publish their research online, uh, for instance, in physics, and actually some of those uh, efforts uh, continue, uh, continue today. Um, of course, there's always been a very ideological component there as well, um, you know, this idea to make research available to anyone, anywhere, uh, without barriers. So that really developed during the 90s and the early uh, 2000s. And then there was really a watershed moment in uh, 2003 with the uh, publication of the Berlin Declaration on Open Access. And essentially this was a set of guidelines that really for the first time uh, formally defined open access. You know, it, it, it had a few requirements also on, on reuse, what I just said. Um, uh, and it has also been really instrumental in sort of um, uh, accelerating open access policies uh, from funders and also from, uh, from institutions. Got it. So let me, let me ask you what might be an uncomfortable question for someone in your position. But um, if, if, you know, the, this ideal of uh, open access seems to be so, you know, basic, um, you know, I can think of so many different applications, you know, from the very, from the first, the very practical frustration of, of any of the researchers uh, sitting in this room who've come up against a paywall that they can't access and, you know, have to debate whether they want to shell out their own money uh, to access the research, to even just a family who has a sick relative wants to better understand, you know, what disease they have and how, what are the potential, uh, uh, you know, treatment plans. 
Um, it seems pretty obvious that 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 open you know research is a is a beneficial thing to to society, to science, and to the world. So why was there a pushback uh, from some publishers, uh, especially some of the big publishers, um, and why were they hesitant to adopt uh, the open access models? Um, do you think it was just a, a, a monetary financial issue or were there some inherent problems that they noticed and saw that weren't being addressed? No, I don't. I mean, I don't think, you know, they were against it per se, because as you say, nobody can be against, you know, the, the benefits of research being openly available uh, anywhere to, to anyone. So I don't think there, there was a dark motive. But, you know, from my understanding, this was also definitely the case in the sort of the, the, the early days of open access, maybe when it was really... You know, the concept was there, but it was still very much an ideological concept. Um, and, you know, publishers are also deeply pragmatic, so they want to make things happen. And, you know, I think there were a lot of question marks at the time, like how, how can we make this happen? How can we recoup these costs? Um, uh, yeah, what business models should, should we use? Um, so I think that that was really uh, the key uh, uh, there. Um, and of course, you know, many publishers really embraced open access now, uh, even sort of the, the bigger publishers that were initially maybe a little bit more hesitant. Um, uh, recently, the University of California made a big agreement with Elsevier, for instance, which was in a way almost uh, another watershed uh, moment. Um, but, you know, I think what I mean from, from Rail's perspective, what's maybe even more important is that you know, not just in the STEM fields and the, the big publishers, they adopted and embraced open access, but it's also really grown in the last five years or so in the in uh, humanities and social sciences, uh, and also, you know, among smaller publishers, society publishers, medium-sized publishers. Um, uh, and yeah, that, that is a great, uh, great development, um, especially the last two years, there really have been a lot of you know, there's been a lot of er experimentation with different models and with different surfaces to make open access more inclusive, if you will. Um, so yeah. I think that's definitely the spirit we're, we're in now. So because you brought, because you mentioned uh, the University of California uh, and the story there, um, I just want to give a little bit more background and, and maybe ask you a follow-up about that. Um, obviously, it's not, you know, this was not involving Brill, but there's a, from what I understand, please correct me if I get any of the details wrong, um, the, 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 the main uh, or one of the main uh, funding sources for publishers is that they uh, sell big bundles of either journals or, um, or uh, series uh, to university libraries. Um, and university libraries, uh, you know, determine on a case by case basis what research they want to purchase for their institution. And that's what enables the researchers to have the access that they need in order to, uh, to, to read and to uh, learn from the research. And um, Slowly over time, uh, some of those prices sort of went up incrementally or even went up uh, exponentially uh, to the point where uh, the University of California turned around and, and said that they're no longer, um, you know, uh, uh, coming to an agreement with Elsevier. Um, and they refused to purchase their journals, which on the one hand uh, was quite the stand in terms of the statement it made. On the other hand, probably was quite crippling to uh, some of the researchers at the university who weren't able to access some of that research. So can you just talk for a minute and, and, and as you mentioned, since then, um, they have come to an understanding and they have come to an agreement, which I think is, is probably in the best interest of, you know, of, of, of everybody, um, uh, you know, and hopefully uh, pushes us forward. But can you just, you know, comment on that and just tell us, you know, I'm not asking you to comment specifically on Elsevier, but, you know, that, that story and, and what you think we can learn from it in terms of, uh, you know, how open access maybe should or should not be rolled out or, or, or you know, the, um, yeah, how, how we should approach that. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, so I can't comment for, for Elsevier, of course, because uh, I, I, I have no idea about sort of the, the details that, that were at play there from, from either side. Um, uh, I mean, you know, in essence, um, uh, what, what I think from our perspective, from Brill's perspective, um, I mean, there have been the, 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 this, this idea with the with the big packages that you know went up and up in price obviously that that hasn't been uh, a good development and you know that's that has also been difficult for us as sort of a medium-sized publisher because we're sort of in the middle of of that you know we, we really don't have those prices or those developments but you but there has been a lot of um uh, you know it, it has really 
damaged for a while, I think, the sort of the, the reputation of the industry as a whole. So, you know, in that sense, I think where we, we were all sort of, um, that was really a bit disappointing, you know, that, uh, that, that was, uh, that there was, that we had so much tension instead of kind of working towards something together with the libraries. So, you know, in that sense, really, really happy that, that it is resolved. Um, you know, I think it's, it's difficult because their skill is so very different and, um uh it's 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 you know where where that's going to go i i'm not so sure um you know you can get into some kind of philosophizing about consolidation and all of that in in, in any kind of industry i suppose but you know that's not really uh, relevant for now uh, maybe um yeah i i mean for it's i think good to mention that for publishers like brill these kind of agreements are actually very interesting sort of medium-sized publishers because they and but maybe we'll also get to that later, but because they do um, uh, um, create open access opportunity for authors that don't usually have access to open access otherwise. So there, you know, there's not a lot of funding in the humanities and social sciences. So if we don't make agreements with libraries, basically it will be really difficult to, to make that work. So I am convinced that's, and that's yeah, why it is really good that Elsevier has been able to, to reach an agreement. You know, the way forward is really working together, you know, with funders, but also definitely with, with libraries. Right. Okay. I want to change, um, I want to change uh, course for a second and, and, and ask you specifically about your, um, you know, your role and what your day-to-day -day as, uh, as, you know, head of open access at, uh, at Braille, what does that look like? What exactly does your work entail? Uh, how do you work together with authors and, you know, what is your, what is your day, you know, uh, uh, consist of? Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, it's super versatile. It's a very, uh, we, what we already saw, you know, it's such a kaleidoscope. So that also means that there are a lot of, uh, uh, you know, very, it's a really dynamic uh, role. But uh, essentially, I uh, manage and develop a uh, Brill's uh, open program. So I, you know, keep track of all the open access publications that we do. Um, I, I work and I advise our uh, publishers, but of course, also our authors and our editors uh, on, uh, you know, new open access projects. Um, uh, and I try to make sure that the services that we offer are up to date with, uh, with market developments. So that also means that I really follow closely uh, funder policy developments uh, because they also have a big impact, of course, on, on how open access uh, develops. Um, uh, and also, you know, keeping close touch with university libraries and uh, by consequence, also our, our sales team who are, of course, the main sort of contact with uh, or uh, with the university libraries and, uh, and universities, um, um, you know, to kind of really see what their needs are and their changing needs uh, in, uh, in open access. And one of the things in particular that, that we have been working on really the past couple of years um, is to, to make it more um, uh, inclusive, if you will. So yeah, what I just said, give authors without funding also the opportunity to, to publish in open access um, and really be creative in finding uh, options to fund open access uh, if there is no research funding available. Um, so that entails, for instance, crowdfunding, um, but also uh, agreements with institutions. Um, we actually already have four, so I'm, I'm re we're really proud of that. But we also do partnerships with, with institutions or with um, um, societies, for instance. So, um, yeah, I think we're definitely on, on the right track uh, there. So if I'm an author and let's say I have a manuscript that I, you know, either a journal article or even a full length manuscript that I think, you know, this, it would be great if this was open access and, you know, could get out to the, to, to more people at a, on a larger scale. Cause I think that will be, uh, you know, important. Um, do, how, how would that work? Are, are all of the individual acquisitions editors or journal editors, are they trained to know how to deal with that? Or if I'm an author, do I contact you um, and ask you about it? Like, how does that, you know, how does that work? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's so it's um, usually the contact is, of course, with the uh, acquisitions editor or the associate editor. You know, they are usually the first point of contact for the author. But then at that point, they will usually involve me in the in the um, uh, conversation so that we can kind of have a three way conversation. You know, what do they actually want and to really yeah um, uh, collaborate on, on their ideas uh, together. 
um, for that's more for the bigger projects, for the sort of smaller projects and the journal articles. We uh, also, of course, have our own uh, open access contact point, um, uh, open access at brill.com, uh, where, you know, everyone is free to send any questions they have for, for their open access publishing or, you know, just sort of random questions that they have. And we also get a lot of, of questions there. Yeah. So it depends a little bit, but uh, I hope we're uh, visible enough. Okay, so let me ask you, I wanna get a little bit practical and pragmatic for a minute. Um, and I've seen that this is a question that, 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 that has come up in the chat and it's actually was on my list of questions that I wanted to ask you. So that always works out nicely um, when, uh, when minds meet. Um, is there a difference in terms of the qual, there seems to be this, this um, theory out there that there's a difference in terms of the quality of research or the review process that an open access uh, either paper or full length manuscript will go through as opposed to uh, a you know traditional um, you know article or or, or book. Um, is there a difference in the level of scrutiny uh, in terms of peer review and the review process between open access and and uh, traditional publishing, or are those or are we mixing up two different categories? Yeah, absolutely. I think so, and maybe that's that's also kind of the the legacy, if you will, of the whole predatory publishing thing that that maybe we will discuss later on but um i mean essentially there is no difference whatsoever um uh, in in the workflow so is stephanie are you with us oh any uh, same quality um uh, control whether it's open stephanie, access or not stephanie. open access is just a an aspect in the process oh. i apologize i think you got you may have gotten cut off there for a minute so could you repeat that last sentence or two yeah, sure. C can you hear me okay now? Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, so it, you know, the, the process is exactly the same, regardless of whether uh, a publication is open or not. Um, we peer review all our publications, uh, I think usually double blind. Um, so there is no, absolutely no, no difference whatsoever. And open access is just an aspect in the process, but it's not, it's, it's completely, um, uh, how do you say that, um, uh, besides the quality control and the editorial control um, and the editorial screening. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think what might happen is that sometimes I think people uh, may confuse open access with preprints, um, where preprints are, you know, a, a version of the article that can be thrown up online, maybe before uh, it's really been through the thorough peer review process, this was actually, I know, a big issue, uh, with, you know, it continues to be an issue with the uh, corona pandemic is that uh, researchers in the hopes of trying to get their research out there quickly would put up, um, you know, an article uh, or a study that they did in order to, you know, for other scientists to be able to access it before it goes through the whole peer review process. And then sometimes journalists would sort of pick up on it and quote it in mainstream newspapers. And then it was just proven later on. So it creates all these issues. Um, um, and I think that sometimes, I, I wonder if sometimes, you know, there's a confusion between uh, preprints, which is before the peer review process, and then uh, open access, which is in theory um, after the uh, you know a full a full review process. Um, as you mentioned, in fact, I think I saw uh, recently that out of the top ten science journals, um, I know where humanities and social sciences uh, is our focus uh, today, but in the science journals, I think six out of the top ten um, journals uh, are now open access, or at least have an open access option. Um, so I think that, that that definitely demonstrates that it doesn't necessarily impact the quality or rigor of the uh, review process. That's an important, I think well, that's one of the important myths uh, that's out there. That being said, we'll talk about predatory publishers and what how that came about and why people should be very vigilant and, 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 and watch carefully. Um, but I want to ask you a, a similar question, but related question, but a little bit different. Um, it, and that, that question is a question of impact, right? So is there a practical, aside from the, you know, ideological, uh, which I think, you know, most of us can agree on that there's an ideological, uh, you know, uh, benefit, uh, or there's a scientific benefit in just making uh, uh, research open to as many and as far reaching uh, as possible. But is there a very practical uh, 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 impact in terms of, uh, you know, career, in terms of uh, citations, let's say? Um, do, have you seen that there's any difference between uh, articles that are published uh, traditionally uh, or articles that are published open access in terms of what impact they're having on uh, research. I guess it, open access has been around long enough that we can start trying to, you know, take a look at some of those issues and, and, and compare and contrast. 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And there is a, there re there really is a difference. Um, and to illustrate that, maybe it's good to to mention a, a study that Springer Nature actually did in 2018. Um, they took 20 they sampled uh, 20 no 74,000 uh, articles that they published both open access as well as not open access and um, uh, you know to, to indeed find out the, the impact um, and the results were really um, uh, impressive um, the they found that open access articles on average are um, downloaded four times more often uh, than sort of comparable articles that, that are not published in open access um, they're cited one and a half times more often uh, also more quickly uh, after a publication um, and they had um, a sort of altmetrics activity two and a half times more often. So that means sort of activity on social media, but it can also be sort of mentioned in, in newspapers or in, in policy making, or um, uh, that's what altmetrics uh, tracks. And uh, at Brill, I think we, we see uh, more or less the same uh, numbers um, for journal articles as well as for, uh, for books, actually, interestingly. Um, and what is an additional, uh, uh, um, uh, what's, what's also really interesting is that um, we see that it re you really do reach a global uh, audience, which, you know, kind of makes sense if you think about it. But we see that in particular for sort of local studies. So say that we publish something on music in Brazil um, and it's published in open access, then we can really see a peak of activity, um, you know, peak of downloads from Brazil, you know, even compared to, kind of another publication also in open access, but not necessarily on, you know, uh, on Brazil. Um, so that's also really, uh, really interesting that you really have very targeted, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, reach. Yeah, I mean, I think we were chatting about this yesterday. We were talking about, you know, conferences and how conferences have just become so much more equitable in the sense that, you know, you don't need to pay for an expensive flight and then an expensive hotel to attend a conference. You just need, you know, a, a, a computer and, and some internet access and, and that's enough to attend nowadays, um, or at least some conferences. And I think it's similar, similar um, with with open access, which, and, and I think maybe this is a point that gets overlooked. Is aside from, uh, you know, uh, making it uh, making research accessible to to you know um, uh, to researchers in in you know in, in places where they have a, a, a strong infrastructure for research. Um, there are also many researchers. Uh, whose institutions don't support, um, you know, these big packages that are sold to the libraries, and they don't have the funding for it. And uh, and developing countries, um, whereby you know, making that research accessible actually is the difference between, um, you know, being able to do the research and not being able to do it. And and I think that we've, you know, maybe a secondary result of this is that you will see more and more research that's coming from developing countries because they now have the access to the. Uh, background in the, the literature that they need in order to conduct their own studies or to try and replicate studies that have been done in other places and see how they come out uh, locally. So that's really interesting what you're saying about the uh, the local impact of, um, you know, open access, you would think, okay, now it's just everyone's going to download it from everywhere, but I guess it also, you know, makes a difference on a local level. Fantastic. Um, okay. Uh, now, all right, let's get into the, what I, what I, what is the, uh, um, you know, elephant in the room, uh, maybe, and that is, uh, the question of financing and, and, and money. Um, now, uh, you know, I, I think we, we've said a number of times that in principle, uh, you know, the, the concept of open access is nice. Uh, it's nice until you come to a, uh, you know, to, to publish your article and they say, okay, that'll be, uh, 4,500 euro and you turn around and say, Oh wait, you know where where am I supposed to find that money uh, from, and and you know who's paying for that? So exactly what was supposed to help researchers um, th this concept of open access? Um, I've even I even spoke to one head of a research office who told me that she discourages her uh, you know her faculty from publishing open access because it's just so costly, and she keeps on getting requests from researchers. Can you pay for you know another thousand dollars or another two thousand dollars? Uh, you know, and, and that's in institutions where they will part, support either partially or full, fully, um, but in, in institutions where they don't, I mean, they're really, really asking beyond all the other expenses that researchers have to, um, to, to shell out a lot of money um, out of pocket. So do you think this is a sustainable model, um, asking uh, researchers or having the burden of, or the onus of uh, the financial responsibility beyond the researchers? And if it's not, like, how do we get past it? Or is there any other models that you can see that you think are, you know, viable and sustainable 
um, that can actually support open access without just you know making the researchers bankrupt while they're doing it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and you know that's um, also funnily enough that's that's um, uh, one of the advantages almost I would say of working in the humanities and social sciences because you know we we don't have much funding to begin with, <laughs> so we need to be more creative uh, already to in order to to um, uh, to publish open access and to to encourage open access. Um, so you know there are a few um, uh, there are indeed a few few. Uh, options out there um, and you know I think ideally we, we also work towards solutions where authors don't don't have to pay um, so one of those for instance is um, uh, a sort of a sponsored model we have 30 uh, full open access journals that are sort of sponsored by third parties so authors don't have to pay to to publish there at all um, the other one is what we also briefly discussed just now, uh, an uh, institutional agreement. These are also usually for, uh, for journals. Um, we have four of those agreements now, uh, one in the UK, one in the Netherlands, uh, one in Sweden, and one in, with the University of Austria in Vienna. Um, uh, and those actually allow uh, authors you know, affiliated to those universities to publish in all of our journals also uh, free of charge. Um, and we now have uh, nearly 400 journals. So, you know, I think in that those are those kind of library agreements where, uh, you know, behind the scenes, uh, the idea is that um, subscription spending is transitioned into um, open access spending. So, you know, also so that, you know, an option that's more or less cost neutral, you know, libraries don't have to spend more and over time they um, uh, spend uh, on open access. Um, and those are, uh, I, I briefly see the chat, so I'll just respond to that directly. Those are indeed the, the consortia consortia agreements um so just, you know i think for for authors that's also sorry, a very explain what what can you know for those who aren't familiar what consortia agreements are yeah sure so those are the, that's those institutional agreements so a consortium is um the is a, a group of uh, un university libraries uh, on a national level um and they usually negotiate definitely in europe they um uh, negotiate with publishers with the bigger publishers for these agreements so it's kind of on a large scale um, for both open access, uh, so typically they negotiate agreements about uh, both open access as well as um, subscriptions. So in case of real, what uh, uh, the, the UK consortium JISC, for instance, they say for the UK universities, they get the full Braille collection, all of our journals, and also authors um, can publish in open access for free in all of those journals. So that's what such a deal uh, looks like um, uh, in short. Interesting. So in that model, in that model, from what I understand, really it's the universities that will be, you know, taking on the long-term burdens of, of open access, but in theory, it, you know, evens itself out with the money that they're saving from, you know, the library costs of purchasing the access uh, to, to, the, to that research um, that they've been doing until now. Uh, I've also seen, you know, maybe this is more in the sciences, but I've also seen that, uh, you know, grant uh, funding bodies who have, uh, you know, who you, you can now request open access as one of your uh, budgetary uh, requests. Um, so I wonder if that's another avenue for open access funding is uh, when you are applying for a grant or, you know, from a, uh, from at least certain uh, grant funders uh, to, to include that in the budget. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I think uh, the first thing that I would say there is always check um, carefully when, when you are applying for a grant, always check carefully uh, what the funder offers because some funders actually offer a separate budget for uh, just for open access publishing so then you don't have to include it in your own grant you can simply apply for this budget whenever you uh, whenever you need it uh, provided that you receive the grant of course um, but indeed if you are supposed to include it in your grant budget uh, yeah think about that you know think about whether you want to publish in open access which publications do you want to publish in open access? And actually, I also really encourage researchers to um, to to reach out to to us, you know, to to publishers, um, because we can help you with a budget. We can help you with um, uh, you know, kind of a publishing strategy. Doesn't mean you know, in case of Braille, but it doesn't have, mean you have to publish everything with Braille. Of course, we understand that usually uh, authors or you know researchers want to publish in with different publishers, but you know, just to to support you. Um, 
Uh, and also, um, uh, if you do want to publish some of that, uh, some of that output with Braille, then we can also uh, uh, talk about kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, we can lump it all together and we can maybe talk about a discount or um, uh, maybe make a kind of a deal basically for, for, that, uh, for that output. Yes, I was going to I was going to ask you about that. Uh, just as a follow up, are there, you know, it, it's a little bit, it reminds me a little bit of like a marketplace, you know, where, where, you know, there's that number and then you ask yourself, okay, you know, all right, they're asking for $2,500. Is, is there an expectation from the publisher's end that the author is going to come back and start negotiating with that rate? Um, how much are the rates set in stone versus how much are they negotiable? Would you recommend negotiating and how, you know, what, what should that process look like? You know, I think, I think especially, uh, you know, researchers, we don't necessarily tend to be the most aggressive uh, uh, business people uh, out there. And I think that, you know, maybe that could be a bit intimidating to feel like, okay, well, is it appropriate to, to ask for a discount? Like, how would you go about that? Yeah, absolutely. That's also a really good question. And I mean, <laughs> the short answer is there's always room for negotiation. Um, I mean, definitely for the, 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 the larger projects, uh, if you will. So with that, I mean a book or maybe a special issue, but even a journal article, you know, if you, if you have maybe some budget, but you don't have the full budget, then do by all means reach out uh, definitely to Brill. <laughs> I can't uh, vouch for, for other publishers, of course, but, um, but in our case, you know, the, the charges we have, they, uh, they are based on sort of standard calculations, but it really depends per project, what that project needs and what the individual costs are. And there may well be some, you know, margin for, for flexibility and, uh, and for, for haggling. So do haggle. Uh, we are also very happy to haggle. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Uh, can you talk for a minute about, um, about the, there are different kinds of journals, and I think this is where people can get a bit confused. Uh, I know that people come across uh, gold options, green, op green options, uh, sounds like a leprechaun, uh, and, uh, and, and, and also, um, you know, hybrid journals. So can you just uh, give us, organize for us a little bit uh, what the different terms are and uh, what, how, did, how they should be understood when going to, to submit your research? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's, it's just as a side note, I mean, when I was thinking about about this and I, I <laughs> feared this would come up and, uh, you know, I think that these terms are one of the reasons that open access is some can seem so, so complex because they're really niche and, you know, they maybe serve a purpose to some people, but not to 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 others. And they just make it all maybe necessarily uh, unnecessarily complicated. But I'll do my best to explain it uh, briefly. Um, so uh, basically, a hybrid journal is what you, I think most researchers would recognize as a regular subscription journal. Um, so it's it's uh, it's sold by a subscription, and the term hybrid comes from the the idea that it's um, ex most articles will be published as regular articles, and they can be accessed if uh, someone has um, uh, access to that journal via their library who has a subscription but it also publishes open access articles. Um, so that's that's where the term hybrid uh, comes from. Um, and with regards to colors, I mean, that's 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 even more sort of, you know, dazzling to me where, where does that even come from? But, um, you know, I think with gold, that's probably what, um, what you know, when, when I talk about open access, that's what gold is really what, uh, what I mean with open access. So it's, um, uh, Gold, gold means that the final version, the published version, is available in open access with, with the license. Um, but of course, on the other hand, with gold, there is some funding needed somewhere because we can't sell the publication anymore. So one way or another, we recoup the costs, either via an agreement or uh, via crowdfunding or, or any other um, uh, mechanism. And with green, uh, that, that's another story. So with green, your uh, publication is published with, with the publisher as it would, it's sold, you know, if it's a book, it's just sold regularly, or if it's a journal, it's just um, a subscription in a subscription journal. Um, but the author, and, and Green is also really with the author, so the author can then archive um, uh, their, usually their manuscripts in the uh, repository, usually of the university, but can also be another uh, repository, maybe a subject repository that's, that's relevant to them, or, or a fun repository. But yeah, of course, you don't have there the sort of the benefit with the with the citations and the um, uh, um, and the impact. Right. So I, I have so many questions, but I, I I know that we are limited in time, and there's another important topic that I want to get to. But um, I I feel like we're a little bit in the tip of the iceberg. 
um, in terms of uh, you know what, what we can explore here. So I do encourage everyone to continue researching and 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 asking us questions uh, afterwards as well. Um, okay, I want to get to an important uh, topic, uh, which is predatory publishers. Uh, from what I understand, and and again, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, what has happened is is a very uh, uh, maybe probably something that wouldn't have been predicted or or couldn't have been anticipated or, or wasn't anticipated, which is that um, because of this model whereby journals or uh, publishers are charging uh, before an article is published um, and not to libraries, but to individual authors, uh, there have been uh, what I guess would, we would call scam artists uh, who have put up uh, fake journals. And when I say fake journals, uh, you know, there's a debate right now about how you define a fake journal, um, but let's just say it's journals who don't go through a thorough peer review process uh, journals who oftentimes uh, will simply take the text that you send them and just put it straight up on their website. Uh, journals that don't have an editing and review um, system in place. Uh, and those are known as predatory publishers. Um, now, there are also publishers that are sort of vanity publishers, which are publishers um, that maybe uh, uh, do charge, uh, that, that do have a, a proper review uh, uh, process and are, are a little bit different. Uh, but I want to focus uh, for today on, um, on the topic of predatory publishers. Uh, so it seems like they've basically seen an opportunity to make a quick buck um, and are taking money from scholars to put in their journals uh, or their uh, series, but really all they're doing is just putting it up on a website, which, you know, doesn't cost them any more than $2 a month uh, to, to host. Um, so this is sort of an unintended consequence collateral damage of, of, of open access. It's not, I wouldn't blame open access for it, um, but can you just talk a little bit about uh, this trend and this phenomenon and what authors should do to protect themselves and make sure that they're not falling into this trap. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, that's, that's, uh, it, it indeed is an unfortunate side effect of um, uh, sort of the, the APC model. So where you, uh, if you publish an, op an, ex an article in open access, you, uh, you pay a fee. Um, and, you know, they, they are proliferating. Well, I really anywhere, to be honest, uh, and also a lot of, Authors recently, we had uh, I think a pro author who, uh, who who shared a story that they fell for it a couple of years ago, uh, and you know their their methods are so cunning. One of the things that they do is, is indeed that they, for instance, they take the, the the title of the journal is super reminiscent of uh, a title of a similar journal in the field that's very well known, you know, very established. So people are really tricked uh, in, into these uh, these things, and it's really cunning. Um, you know, I think the one thing that I would always recommend to anyone is to uh, check uh, the directory of open access journals. They're really the index for open access journals and also the one source. And they have a very rigorous and strict uh, quality control in place before they uh, uh, admit any new journals, like you say, Avi, with, which is really all about, you know, editorial uh, procedures and peer review and yeah, just basically making sure that any journal that, that is admitted there is, um, uh, is the real deal, so to speak. So if a journal is not listed in there, then, then I would always al already be cautious. Um, and also, uh, uh, yeah, check, you know, check with some colleagues of yours, whether they know the journal, have they published there? Um, uh, and yeah, all the things that you just mentioned, Avi. And also, you know, um, indeed about payment, you should never um, uh, usually, or I think um, nearly with basically all publishers, you only pay once your article has been accepted for publication. So you don't have to pay, you know, whenever you're submitting, but only once it's been um, uh, accepted. Yeah. Yeah. I think a few other things that I've noticed are, uh, you know, scholars who get inundated with emails. You know, if you get an email from someone you don't know and you look them up and they don't seem to have a serious reputation online, it's not connected to anyone in your field. Uh, that should be suspicious if there's a journal website has a lot of grammatical mistakes as their English yeah. is poor, you know, it could be a sign. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. look at the, always look at the editorial board, you know, assuming you know the people in your field. Are they reputable? Are these universities that you know and are familiar with? Um, and then there are some lists uh, online which are up kept, such as Beale's list, um, where you have uh, uh, scholars who are basically putting up, uh, you know, names of journals that should that are suspect. Um, that being said, they proliferate so fast that sometimes it's kind of hard to keep track, even yeah. if, uh, you know, even if you try, it might not be on the list. The fact that it's on the list doesn't mean necessarily that it's a reputable publisher. So uh, definitely keep that in mind. Um, yeah, there's a lot more to say about that as well, but I, uh, uh, but, but I, I really do want to get to people's questions because I know that there are some good questions here. Um, before we do that, um, um, I just want to bring everyone's attention 
Uh, I'm going to I'm going to uh, share my screen quickly uh, again uh, for our upcoming events. Uh, we have uh, so just give me one second here. Uh, there's uh, every month uh, we have a session. So if you enjoyed this one, uh, please do uh, be on the lookout for our upcoming events. Uh, here you can see the events for June and July. Uh, next month, I'm very excited uh, to be hosting uh, Marshall Poe, who's the editor-in-chief of the New Books Network. I don't know uh, if you're familiar with the New Books Network. Uh, it's a series of podcasts in different fields about new books that come out in that field, and he was the uh, founder and visionary behind that. So he's going to discuss uh, how scholars can use new media to maximize the impact of their research. Uh, it's not enough today just to publish and hope the publisher does everything for you. Um, I'm sure Stephanie will attest to the fact that the more authors are involved in, how, in getting their research out, the more successful it is in the end of the day. So that's, we'll be discussing that in June. Uh, and then in July, I'm going to be discussing, I'm going to be speaking um, with uh, two wonderful editors uh, from, uh, from Oxford University Press about uh, publishing with your career in mind. How do you think about publishing um, in a way which not only is beneficial in the short term, uh, but can be very beneficial uh, in the long term as well and help scholars uh, to promote their careers. You know, some scholars want to uh, become well-known figures in, in, in general society. Some scholars prefer to just be left on their own and, 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 uh, and, and move ahead in the academic world. So, so we're going to talk about how to position yourself uh, in an effective way. So that's going to be uh, in June and July. Please do sign up um, free as always, well, as always, and will always be free. Um, and uh, here's our contact information, uh, both for Stephanie and myself. Um, if you do have any questions that we didn't have time, I saw we had a lot of questions, which is great. That's a sign that people are interested and engaged, and that's wonderful. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, I'm sorry. It's not because uh, it's not important. It's uh, just we're just limited in time. So please do reach out. Uh, we're both very accessible. Uh, my wife likes to joke that I am too available uh, to my clients. So please do um, be in touch uh, if you do have any questions or follow up, uh, et cetera. Um, my apologies, one second. Uh, again, just uh, uh, just quickly, uh, if anyone does, if you do have any needs uh, for academic translation, academic editing help, uh, or uh, writing consulting, or, or um, help with academic reviews for your research, uh, help putting together book proposal, grant uh, projects, uh, these are all um, areas where we can help uh, authors and we can help scholars. Uh, so please do, uh, don't hesitate to be in touch with me if you have any questions, if you want to find out more. Uh, you're welcome to just uh, visit our website uh, and uh, and check that out in your free time. Uh, we've helped a lot of a lot of wonderful Braille authors uh, with their research, um, and we we very much enjoy doing so. All right, um, I think uh, that should bring us. Let me just double check here in my notes. My apologies. Um, yes, that will bring us uh, to our Q and A. So uh, thank you everyone again for. Uh, uh, for submitting your questions via the chat. Um, I, uh, I, I recommend that people uh, stick around because there are some really interesting questions here uh, that I think uh, will be relevant to everyone. Um, okay, this is, I want to start out with this one because it's more of a, a, a philosophical question. Um, the, the question is as follows. Open access clearly impacts the way scholarship is distributed and read after it's being produced. But do you think that in any way research, it actually impacts the way research is being done or scholarly writing is being produced in the first place? Um, and if so, uh, how? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, op open access, um, uh, first of all, really, because it's immediately accessible, so it does uh, accelerate the, the speed with which people access research and also accelerates, you know, the sort of, um, you know, I think in the longer term, it also, um, improves the effectiveness of uh, how researchers collaborate. You know, they can collaborate more quickly. Um, I think actually the, the, the COVID crisis was, was a good example uh, of, uh, of that. Um, and whether, uh, you know, and I, th I can see that ultimately maybe it will also sort of change how research is produced itself, but, um, uh, but that's more to do with sort of the traditional form. And there is a lot of debate uh, uh, around that. And, you know, I think no one has that, that answer now. We'll just have to see how, how things develop. You know, will we move to kind of larger sort of publishing platforms or will we still stick to sort of journal brands, which are also kind of communities. So there's also something to, to be said for, uh, for that. Uh, same for, for books, the book series, of course. Uh, when you talk about books, there's always a lot of talk about, you know, maybe open access will, um, um, I mean, a more free form uh, book 
uh, book form. So instead of kind of the book form that we have, maybe very sort of different online reading experience. But I think, you know, those those things are more sort of longer term um, uh, for now that we, we are still, uh, I, I hope that we can still find pragmatic solutions for, for the questions that we, we have today. But um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting to, to think about. Yeah, I think also in terms of, um, you know, I, I've had conversations with uh, Chris Harrison from Cambridge who's told me that, you know, there's there's a certain uh, dynamic, you know, that I think they're defining as dynamic content, you know, so the fact that content is being hosted online just on itself enables people to update and to change and to, you know, make things more relevant as time goes along, whereas maybe, you know, more traditionally things, once you publish something, it's set in stone and there's no changing it ever, unless it's retracted, um, you know, here it's sort of seen as more of a living document, which I also think is very helpful for scholars who have trouble. I know we work with a lot of scholars who have trouble sort of separating themselves and saying, okay, it's ready to go off to print because there's always what to improve and to change. And this enables scholars to kind of um, be updating their research, even if they're working on something else, but if they find that they have something that's, you know, interesting and of note, um, they can kind of work, you know, it, it's a living document as opposed to something which is just, you know, kind of set in stone. Um, okay, let's take, a, I want to I wanna push you uh, 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 on, on a topic that we discussed, but I want to give you a particular scenario and ask you how you deal with it. Uh, let's say there's an author who has checked all their, you know, they've checked their, you know, with their department, or maybe they're unaffiliated, they're independent authors, and they've tried to get funding for their open access, and you know, they've looked and they just, and they tried with the grant you know, funders and they got rejected and they just have not had success. Is it, um, are there individual, uh, you know, granting programs either in Braille or just in general uh, to help scholars in that situation uh, with open access? Or might it be better in that scenario to just tell scholars, you know, in that case, just go and publish traditionally because it's gonna, might be too much. Yeah, it really depends. Um, there are so it's 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 so there are sort of uh, unorthodox, uh, um, you know, fun uh, budgets and and pots that um, uh, you know uh, sometimes authors can apply for. Um, and we we also try to kind of source them. Um, and another thing is uh, one really other thing, um, but that's really only for books. Is um, we work with a, an organization called Knowledge Unlatched, and they organize crowdfunding for um, for books, for op for open access books. So we also participate in that. Um, uh, it's a yearly uh, recurring um, uh, thing, and we also participate in that. So that is always a good option for you know authors um, uh, with with books who really really want to publish in open access, but they don't have uh, access to uh, to funding. Um, but yeah, other than that, you know, we, we, it's some, indeed, sometimes the, the only conclusion is that there is no money available. And then unfortunately, um, we would need to publish kind of traditionally, um, but we try to exhaust all the options before, before we come to that decision. Yeah. And, and is there, are there specific fields that, um, where open access is more or less prevalent or more or less relevant specifically? Is there a distinction between maybe the humanities and social sciences and more of the STEM fields? Um, do you find that there's more uh, research that's being published in one or the other that's open or less open? Or do you find that it's more appropriate for one or the other? How do you, yeah. Yeah, it's not, I mean, um, there are definitely some fields, for instance, linguistics, um, that is really a field that, has traditionally, I think, always been very proactive with open access and very keen to publish open access. So you can see there that's also, um, and as a result, you know, and, and, and that's, uh, you know, it's all also because they're, uh, because researchers have really, um, uh, they triggered that. So publishers also try to experiment with, you know, new models to, um, to respond to that demand, if you will. Um, so definitely, that's a good example where where that uh, that happened. Um, but I think on the whole, you do see also in humanities and social sciences as a whole. There, most fields are now kind of I think in a comparable sort of development. Although there is indeed a difference between uh, humanities, social science on the one hand, and the STEM fields on the on the other hand, and that's really funding I think uh, down down to uh, to that. Yeah. Got it. Okay, I want to wrap up with one last question, which I think is, is a good way to sort of summarize our conversation. Um, I, if you could just touch on, without getting into too much detail, uh, what Plan S is and what that means, uh, within the greater context of what the future, how do you see the future of academic publishing? Do you think that in five, 10 years, open we're not even going to use the word open access because 
that's just going to be the default uh, that everyone is doing. Do you think that it's still going to be, you know, a split between, you know, more traditional models and open models? Um, and what role does Plan S, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what Plan S is, what role do you think that will play uh, or other similar initiatives will play in changing uh, and, and formulating policy uh, about open access? Yeah, um, yeah, let me just start with, with what Plan S is. I think it's another kind of in-crowd uh, thing <laughs> almost, um, but it's, um, uh, it is a set of guidelines uh, produced by 11 European uh, research funders um, to uh, to sort of um, develop further develop their own uh, open access policies, um, and it's uh, it's it's for both journals as well as books. Uh, it came into effect. Um, the the policy for books has not been announced just yet, but the policy for journals uh, journal articles uh, has that was um, came into effect uh, in January this year. Um, uh, and uh, I think one of the key elements of Plan S and that kind of, I guess, directly relates also to, you know, the potential impact that they have um, is that journals need to show some kind of commitment to transition to open access um, uh, in due course. Um, you know, and that is something that is really interesting where you, that you can really go, go into that, but uh, I, I don't think we have the time for that uh, today, but um, there are a number of ways that, that publishers can, can do that. One of them is actually via those consortia agreements that we just discussed. So that's another reason that we are really happy that we're able to, to do that because it also means that we, um, yeah, and you know, I think what every publisher of course wants is to continue to offer authors um, uh, uh, an option to publish with them, but also to make sure that they can comply with, with this policy. So, you know, we at Brill, we've been working really hard to, to make sure that that is the case. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I hope that for authors, it's more or less seamless, you know, they, they don't have to, to worry too much um, uh, about it. It's also, if you think about it more broadly, it's almost because these funders already had an open access policy in place. So, you know, it's not like um, there, there, there won't even be such a change for authors from that perspective. It's almost more of a, a conversation between publishers and funders um, than it really is about, about policy uh, itself. Um, but yeah, having said that, you know, um, the, I think five to 10 years is actually not, not a very long time. <laughs> I think if you look a little bit further ahead, then I can see that open access uh, could be predominant or maybe it's even unavoidable. Um, but what we need, of course, is global buy-in. And that is really the key, what's missing at the moment. Uh, also, what Plan S is missing. I mean, it's 11 European research funders. They are not responsible for the majority of the research published. There is, of course, also open access activity in the US and also some in Asia, but they're also, you know, that not, not, there are still large kind of pieces of the puzzle missing. And that's really something that, that well, I certainly hope that that will, you know, um, grow in, 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 in the, the, the decade to, uh, to come. But um, that's really what needs to happen. Institutions around the world need to kind of, uh, flip their own spending, not on products, but on open access. And that's kind of the mindset change, I suppose, that, that needs to, uh, to happen. Uh, and whether it will, I mean, I, I certainly hope it does, of course, but um, yeah, we'll have to uh, wait and see. Brilliant, brilliant. Stephanie, I, I really want to thank you uh, very much. I know that I learned a tremendous amount over the last hour and, you know, uh, and I, I deal with this on a daily basis, but there was, there was a lot that I didn't know. And I, I imagine that, you know, I speak on behalf of, uh, of, of the attendees as well, um, that we learned a lot uh, from your insight and from being 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 willing to share openly uh, about you know both the triumphs but also challenges of of open access. Um, I thank everyone for their participation. I mean that this was a quite a, a lively chat, which was great, and that's exactly what I want to see is is people getting involved and asking questions and and debating back and forth. Um, I wish we had time to to play all these out. Uh, you know, in their in their full uh, in their full glory, but we don't necessarily have that time. Um, so, thank you, everyone, again for coming. Um, you please do feel free to reach out to us uh, if you do have further questions uh, or, uh, or 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 just want to learn more. Um, I know that we're going to be sending out um, a recording with some additional uh, with some additional uh, resources. Uh, over the next few days. So be on the lookout for that um, and make sure that you, you know, take a look and then share it with any colleagues who weren't able to be here. Um, so 
thanks so thanks everyone for coming i know it's uh you know some of us are zoomed out after so many zoom sessions and 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 having uh you know and and taking and and being exhausted from what was the, from the last year and a half um so i appreciate you making the time to join us today um and look forward to seeing you at our uh, upcoming events so thanks stephanie and uh everyone have a great day thank you so much everyone it was really great to to be here thank you everyone